today we are going to talk um, about a few things. Uh, but what I what I first want to thank some people for is that uh, last Sunday I was in um, I was in Chandler uh, preaching in a small church there, and yeah, we had there. what's that? Yes, yes, it was. Town of 270 people. Yeah. And what was really nice is that we had um, some people travel from Good News uh, to, to be there. And it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing for me to see those familiar smiling faces come in because it was a very nerve-wracking experience to start with. But um, I thank you. Uh, it was it was wonderful to have you there. Um, next, uh, that there's two churches there: the RCA and the CRC, and this was the RCA, yeah, the Reformed Church of uh, Chandler. Yeah, but it was over a hundred year old church, um, and it was it was elegant but very plain, um, which was just awesome. And uh, they had just a wonderful congregation and got to spend some time talking to them afterwards for about half hour, 45 minutes. And they had lost their pastor, not to death, but um, to leaving. Uh, and so they were doing some pulpit supply. And um, it was, yeah, it was really nice, though. It was, it was a nice, nice way to spend a Sunday. So, uh, all right. Uh, first, this expository preaching, do you guys know what that means? Does anybody know what that means? Yeah, right. So essentially what expository preaching is, is really diving into what the verses mean. What is it that the, that the Word of God is telling us? Um, this is something that uh, I, I listened to a, a theologian down from Dallas uh, Seminary. Theological seminary, and he said that this is kind of, it's it what it's kind of what it used to be, um, but things have kind of changed with time as to where a lot of what we hear nowadays is um, how does it apply to us, right? How do the passages that we read apply to us? Which is very important, but what is also very important, and this is. One of my passions is really diving into what does God want us to hear from this? What does He want us to know? Why did He give us these words and these, these stories and these parables and these events? Because everything that He has written there is by far more important than I'm going to say. Right? Those words that He has given us are crucial uh, for us to know and for our lives. So they far outweigh whatever I'm going to opine about anything. So I, what I really would like to do is kind of start with this um, approach uh, to Luke 16, 19 to 31. Um, I am, this is something that I'm going to be putting a sermon together on. And I'm also a firm believer that uh, I don't want to be sitting in my office writing a sermon all by myself. Because now that is a, the word from me. That's opining from me. What I like to do is take these verses to my Bible study, to my mentors, to you guys, and just get a feel from, for what it is that uh, we read these scriptures to mean. But then what is it that God wanted us to hear? Fair enough? All right. So um, let's pray, and then I'm going to read this uh, story slash parable aloud, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of time to kind of uh, commune and fellowship and learn uh, from each other, and then we're going to get back into it, and we're going we're gonna to dissect this thing and see what, what God wanted us to know. All right? So dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, this beautiful morning. I thank you for bringing these people here together for fellowship and for community. Lord, help us to learn from one another, to learn from your word. 
to get my mouth and my mind and my heart out of this, Lord, and just allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us and allow us to come together as one body to hear your message. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I will read from, I imagine you guys mostly have the NIV versions. Is that right? Okay. So I will read from NIV. And let's go to Luke chapter 16. And we'll start with verse 19. And it's the parable or the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's one that's very, 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 very well known. Um, and just about everybody has heard of it. Just about everybody has gone through it. Um, but are we taking out of it what the Lord wants us to take out of it? Okay, so verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and to cool my tongue, because I am ag in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone, cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg of you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. That story slash parable is absolutely loaded with things and stuff and important points that Jesus elegantly spoke about but are not really noticed just by reading through it once or twice or reading it to our kids. So what I want you to do is I want you to just Speak amongst yourselves a little bit. Each table is fine. And just kind of, I, I just want the overall point, the overall message that this parable slash story gives us. Okay? And I'll give you three, four minutes to discuss that. But just think of the overall premise that Jesus is trying to, to relay to us about this parable slash story. Okay? Give us that. All right, here we go. I did some erasing. All right, uh, here we go. So, table one, what is your overall meaning of the... Well, first of all, is it a parable or a story? A true event? What do you say? Huh? Well, it could be true. It, it does. Okay. The, the first point is to show mercy on the part of the rich man. He did not show no mercy to the Lazarus. Okay. 
And in the second part, he expected that in eternity. Okay. And they won't live. Okay. Yeah, well, how did you put it? Um, yeah, they're not seeking him. I mean, they didn't have to come, but if they're not going to seek him, they're still not going to fight. Okay. Table two. Well, so you guys say true story or parable? True. True? Okay. How about here? Well, now, Julia, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I guess I assumed it was a parable because he calls them parables. Okay. Fair enough. And what's the meaning? Basically that... You have to have faith and believe what the prophet said. Not, you know, you're not going to get a second chance. Okay. Okay. Three. Oh. Um. So you basically you just told me you the last. Verse is what the last verse is the key to it all. All right, that you already have all of the, the knowledge that you need, and even if someone rises from the dead and tells you that at that point it's too late, okay. He said they thought it was probably a story, a story like a true, a, a true story. Okay, versus parable. Okay. 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 So the meaning, overall meaning? What Peg said? Okay. <coughs> Good, good question, Chad. Good question. How about you guys? Parable or story? Okay. Fair. I said parable. Okay. You get parable, story. What do you guys think? Parable. parable. Okay. So we got, there's a variation of what is this, right? And why is it? How about the meaning and the meaning of it? Ladies, the overall meaning of the of the kind of, I, and I think there's something to the man who lived in luxury every day. Okay, like, I don't think he felt like he needed God. He didn't feel like he needed um, to hear what Moses and the prophets had to say. Okay, and so I mean it's kind of the same concept, but now I just feel like now it's too late. Now he wants to hear it. He wants everybody else to hear it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know, yeah, you don't count. We talked about this at, at, uh, at our Bible study about this. So, what do you, overall meaning? I thought it was ironic that here the rich man was still thinking of Lazarus as a servant to him because he wanted him to fetch him the water. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yep, true. And we'll, we'll come across that too. Good point. Okay, so I'll tell you this, that the overwhelming scholarship today will classify this as a parable. Okay? Why? Because A, Jesus spoke and taught in parables. B, it follows the parable of the manager. Right? C, it does not. Uh, it is not consistent with the communication between heaven and hell that Scripture gives us. That Jesus is trying to give us as to what we would engage. Okay, the scholarship that promotes the fact that it is a story or a true event is based upon one fact, or one instance in, in this parable, is that he uses, Jesus uses the name Lazarus. Jesus does not name a subject 
anywhere else in his scripture, anywhere other than Lazarus. Okay? This is the only parable where a subject is given a proper name. But what does Lazarus mean? Lazarus means is a form of Eleazar. Eleazar literally means the one whom God helps. Okay? So, if you dissect that down, Lazarus meaning the one whom God helps, this is very much or could be considered a representation of all whom God helps. Right. Okay? So, that's, that's the scholarship on it. If you tend to fall on the fact that it is a true story, that's so be it. I mean, I, you're not wrong. Um, or is it a parable? The, the evidence is weighed upon parable just because of the other scripture that would be contradicted within the afterlife um, versus whom he is speaking to and why he is speaking. Okay? So what I want to do is now start going through this and dissecting out the key words uh, in this parable now. Okay? Let's start over here. Will you guys read verse 19 for us and give me some words that you think are very important? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Okay. What do you see? What are the words that stand out to you? He was dressed in purple. I don't know why purple, but something purple. Okay. I'm going to throw rich man in there. What's that? I was saying, I think purple is usually referred to as being royal or okay. having money and wealth. Purple? What else? Good. Okay. What else in that? Just those words in that verse. What else you got in there? Ah, good. Every day? What else? I'll put that one in there. All right. So what I want you to look at is just the very beginning of this parable. You could basically put every single word of that verse as important. Okay? So... What you want to look at, too, is context, context, context. Go back up ahead of the parable. Who is the rich man? Who are the rich men? Who is he correlating the rich man to? The Pharisees. And why is he doing that? Yeah, they were rich, but they thought that they were... Yeah, they thought that they were blessed because they were rich. Okay, so if you go up further uh, in 16, let's go to uh, 14, verse 14. It says, the Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eye of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable to God's sight. That is giving you directly who Jesus is going to speak on this parable too, okay? And that leads into the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Now I want you to bounce back up to 13 where it says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What is Luke's entire chapter? What is his focus on? Wealth. He is focusing on the wealth that is being 
proclaimed here and the Pharisees who are running around praying and doing all of these things out in the open and thinking that they are blessed because of their riches. They're blessed in their riches because they are descendants of Abraham. Okay? They're Jews. They're, they're, the, they're the Pharisees. They're the chosen race. They're the descendants of the father Abraham. Right? So that's what he's telling them right here. He's like, the Pharisees who love money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And Jesus then said, you are the ones who justify. God knows your hearts. Okay? So what is really, really important here is rich man is in reference to the Pharisees, right? This is who he's speaking to. What is purple and fine linen? What does that have to do with anything? Royalty. Royalty. Why? The rulers, the royalty, the kings, right? They wore purple. Very expensive purple yeah. Okay. Yes. Pri yes. Very true. What? Very expensive yes. So purple was an extremely rare color in antiquity. Why? Because it was made, it was only could be made by the crushing of the, snee, the sea snail, the murex. The murex would be crushed and you would get one drop of dye, dark red dye, from these sea snails. So these sea snails would have to be crushed thousands of sea snails to dye whatever. I, I don't even, I don't do clothes, but what? Okay, fine, a robe. But what are those things where you roll, what? Huh? Fabric? Whatever. Uh, you go to like... Whatever. Okay, so you go to like Fabric R Us or whatever and you buy a thing, a... A A bolt? Okay, I'll buy that. A bolt. Whatever. You buy a bunch of fabric and in order to get that done, that would take forever to do that. And a lot of people would have to be responsible for crushing these sea snails and dyeing this fabric purple. That's why it was a symbol of royalty, is because it was so expensive to get. Fine linen. That has to do, fine linen refers to undergarments. The best linen, and still to this day, is from Egypt. And it's, it's called byssus. And it is otherwise called woven air, is what it's called. And one ounce of fine linen from Egypt was equivalent to one ounce of gold. So, if you think about what Jesus is telling you here, this man was loaded. All right? Dressed in purple, which was hugely significant to that culture. They knew what that meant. Dressed in fine linen, hugely significant to that culture and lived in luxury or feasted in luxury or lived sumptuously, it depends on your translation, every day, meaning that every day was a party. Every day he dined and ate and, and did whatever the heck he wanted. So this is one rich individual or group of people, okay? Next, let's go to verse 20. Go ahead, Caden, read that. Me? Yep, you. And his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. Okay. What's important there? His <laughs> leg. Okay. What else, though? What? Yeah, good. Right. So he was laid. Okay. What else? A beggar. Sores. Gate. Okay. What does this tell you? The word gate. And portal. Okay. This is no houses had gates. This was a compound. All right. 
the name is also mentioned. Lazarus, the one whom God helps, was laid. Okay? That's hugely significant. Was laid indicates that in that culture, people that were sick, people that were poor, people that couldn't eat, people that couldn't dress, the community would take care of, right? The, the Jews would take care of the Jews that were unable to take care of themselves. However, when it got so bad and the community couldn't take care of those Jews, what would they do? They would take that, they would take that individual and they would go place them in front of the richest people in the community. Why? Because then the rich Jew would then be able to have the means to support, to provide clothes, to provide housing, to provide uh, food to that man or woman, whomever. That they would lay them in front of the rich man's gate, meaning then that this guy just didn't come in there and sit down by himself, is that he was placed there. Right? I mean, he couldn't walk. He was handicapped. He was crippled. He had sores. The sores uh, in, the, in the Greek is, um, it responds to or correlates to ulcers, which means they were seeping, oozing, nasty lesions. Okay? And was laid in front of, la of uh, the rich man's gate. Okay? Next. 21. And long, excuse me, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Longing to eat. Okay. Longing to eat. Okay. Dogs. Right. Good. All right. What about th these? These aren't dogs like house dogs, right? In the first century, they the only dogs that were in the east were called pariah dogs, and they were either work dogs or they were what? Work dogs, guard dogs, or nasty scavenger dogs. All right. These aren't like your little stupid chihuahua that runs around <laughs> that runs around your house. I have one and they are horrible. <laughs> this isn't a lap dog is what we're saying. Is is these things these dogs were probably in the yard of the of the rich man and were probably the guard dogs of the of his compound, right? <laughs> exactly. Right. So, the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, don't think just crumbs, okay? Essentially, this is dog food, all right? Because then all of these scraps or crumbs or whatever would be then given or put outside for those dogs or tossed away into the garbage, which the dogs would then scavenge through and eat. This is like dog food. All right, you couldn't go and buy Alpo or anything like that. These dogs would be fed with the junk that's left. Isn't he in competition with the dogs for the food? No. 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 He's not getting any of it. He's not he's outside the gate. <laughs> and this is inside. The gate. Mm -hmm. So what else is important in this? In this in this culture, the wealthy, you you would eat with your hands, right? And you would dip a lot of stuff into oils and things like that. What they used to dry their hands with or wipe their hands with is they would take the, the old pieces of bread that were on the table or the crust or whatever, and they would wipe their, their hands off, and they would throw that uh, away. So what fell from the rich man's table isn't something that just, it's, it's the waste. It's the discarded stuff. That's also extremely important in the whole trying to get your head around this parable, Okay. Next, 22, the time came and the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man died and was buried. What does this say? So the rich man didn't go to heaven. Wait a second. Don't jump ahead. It doesn't say that. The angels carried him 
Okay, so they both died, right? You have angels carried, and you have buried. All right, you have Abraham's side. Well, in King James, it's Abraham's bosom, right? That's important. That's the only place it's ever used in, in Scripture is that verse, that chapter, that book. Abraham's bosom. All right? So, they both died. It says that the rich man was buried. Means that he probably had everything, right? He had the, the ceremony and a bunch of... Yeah, and, and a bunch of people talking about him and all this kind of stuff at the funeral and blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> Written on bread. So it doesn't, and what does it say about Lazarus? It just says Lazarus died and was carried to, by angels to Abraham's bosom. So what happens to the beggars? Yeah, well, they get, they get disposed of. They get tossed in. Huh? Didn't they have a potter's field? Uh, may, yeah, I, I would just be commenting on that. I know that they had a, uh, like a common grave, like, um, yeah, just a giant big hole where they would throw these, uh, the people that didn't mean anything in life, right? So that was where Lazarus went. That's where his body got tossed and the rich man died. And then it makes a specific claim then that he was buried. All right, so two totally different um, destinies, okay? What's significant about Abraham's bosom? Well, it's the closeness of it. Okay, what, is it, what does it mean? That he's right at his side, almost okay. like a baby. Okay, because, but... And he's obviously... But what does it represent? God. Anybody else? He's well, carrying us. Okay. 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 Keep going. Comfort. Okay. So here's here's something you lose in the NIV. All right. It says there in hell, right? In the next couple verses. Okay. What does yours say? In Hades. In Hades. Okay. So think about that for a second. In Hades is the way it was originally written. Hades is simply what? No. No, 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 no. Hades means the realm of the dead. Okay? Greek. Hebrew, it's Sheol. The realm of the dead. Okay? The deepest part of Hades is the punishment. Okay? That's where unbelievers go. And the other part of Hades would be considered paradise or Abraham's... Right. So now, when this makes sense, all right, is they, dis they went to Hades. All right? Chasm. Reference to by Jesus doesn't mean that that's actually how it is. So we have to be very, very careful about not putting our own beliefs of heaven and hell or what happens to our afterlife in this story. This is not the point of the parable. Okay? But Greek Hades simply means the realm of the dead. All right? And it says, in the deepest part of Hades is punishment. That is Gehenna. Gehenna is, was considered to be like a gigantic fire pit where they burned all the garbage. Right? So Hades... And we have to be very careful not to infer these things. Consists of these two separate spots. The realm of the dead, which is Abraham's bosom or paradise, versus Gehenna, which is where the, the, the punishment or the unbelievers go. 
Okay? So why now is Abraham's bosom so unbelievably significant? In that in those days when people used to eat, right, they sat on the floor, six, eight inches, right, the table. And when they used to eat, they kind of faced the center. So the people sitting on this side would lean on their right arm and eat with their left. And then the people sitting this way would lean on their left arm and sort of eat with their right, right? And they would kind of face the center of the table. If the person behind you was speaking to you, what would you do then? Well, you just kind of lay back, right? Like the one whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Peter fell back into Jesus. Chest. Right. So this could very easily now represent that Lazarus is sitting at the messianic table at a feast. All right. Do you think that there's any any correlation between the fact that Jesus said the rich man feasted every day in luxury and now the tides are turned and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom? Everything, this whole story is flipped. The whole thing, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Rich man, luxury, poor man, junk. Poor man, luxury, rich man, junk. Rich man not struggling, poor man is. Poor man not struggling, rich man is. The whole thing is back and forth. It's a dichotomy, each and every part of this. Okay? Uh, good. All right, next. So he called to him. Who's so he? The rich man, right? So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. What's significant about that? Well, now he wants help. Now he wants All right, but go, start way earlier in that verse. Okay, so the rich man calls to Lazarus. Whoop. Right there. Go back. Right. He calls him Father Abraham. What does that confirm? That he knew God. Yeah. Right. It confirms the Pharisees. It confirms the rich Jews thinking I'm blessed because I'm a descendant of Abraham. So now... He's sitting here, and he calls to Father Abraham. That's not insignificant. That is hugely significant. Father Abraham. And then what does he do? He asks him for pity. Nah, yes, he asks him for pity, but by doing what? Oh, to get a drink. Yeah, get Lazarus. Go get, hey, get that dude. Get him down here to get me some water. Is he asking to get out? Right. He's not asking, he's not saying forgive me. He's not saying, hey, I repent. He's not saying, I want to come up there. He's saying, oh man, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send that boy to bring me some water. He hasn't changed. Death does not change you. You will not change after death. You will be crystallized in your doubt. You will be crystallized in your unbelief. <clears throat> Just because you die denying Christ and you wake up or wherever we are and you see this, it's not changing him. So why would we consider Gehenna, hell, to be unfair for those that haven't chosen him in the world? They completely understand why they're there. They have denied it, and they will continue to deny it. It doesn't change you. 
Is he also seeing himself as an equal to Father Abraham since he's saying, hey, since well, that, that yeah, that's a good question. That's that would be an inference on my part, but but we'll go into something down here a little bit further, where that could be uh, construed to be true. So that means people in Mel aren't aren't going. I was a fool. Let me tell you, right? People in hell, according to D. A. Carson, is filled with religious people. It's filled with people that have denied up here and have lived a certain way up here. And that way is not changed. It is only consecrated or crystallized after you die. Was, so they're not... Go ahead, Tony. And I always thought that I mean, someone who died, they would have an aha moment. I got, you, get, I got you. Right. You would realize that. Exactly. And what that would mean then is that A, you may have a second chance, all right? Or B, that's, that's, that sucks. That's really unfair, right? That takes both of those away. Does that aha moment, like what you're talking about, does that come on the day of judgment when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? It won't change. No, it won't change. Right. But, 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 at the, but at the second coming, that, so that's going to make everything worse or everything better. So this is, I don't want to say temporary because it's permanent, mm -hmm. but it is temporary because Jesus hasn't come yet. Okay? Once Jesus comes, this gets way better. This is probably getting way worse because now everything is there. But in the living, the, the living let's say when Jesus comes down, what the living non-believers will have more... Judgment, no, they'll have the same judgment they do. It'll just be permanent. I mean, there won't be this. It'll be this because, and say same for the believers, the right? Believers will have more physical God. More yeah. Physical God. Yes. Yeah. But then still won't believe because of exactly. But then they'll say, but then once it becomes this, then they'll be like, oh. Lip, you know, <laughs> they might not be saying that, but they might. I wouldn't be saying that. I'd be saying something a lot worse. All right, let's let's get out of here. All right, we'll move on. That almost went awry. Okay, verse tw verse twenty five, verse twenty five says, but Abraham replied, son. Remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things while Lazarus received bad. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. What happens there? He calls him son. Wow, yeah. He calls him son, which demonstrates what? Yeah, it's compassion. I mean, even he's still talking to him compassionately. He's not yelling at him. He's not, you know, he's being forceful to him. But he's also being tender and compassionate to him. Saying, son, dude, man, you had your shot. I kind of did what I could. Yeah, you had it. Son, which also then is in relation to father, which now confirms Pharisee. Get it? Father and son and this whole interaction that's going on between all of these. And notice who's silent. Who doesn't say anything? Lazarus. Yeah, Lazarus. I'm, in, I'm up here, you know, living the good life. This, and, and notice who the rich man is not talking to. He's not talking to Lazarus. Lazarus, we, uh, I know him. I saw him. He was sitting outside my gate. Yeah. Which is now confirming that he would walk by him over and over and over and over and over again because he knew the guy's name. Mm -hmm. Send Lazarus. He knew his name. So it wasn't like, oh. Father Abraham to tell Lazarus. He don't want to tell Lazarus himself. Right. Yeah. So he's just sitting there and he's, he's like, this is a guy I walk, back, I walk by millions of times. This is why... We know that because he was laid at the gate and he knows his name. This wasn't something that he just missed. 
This was something he electively bypassed. Okay. Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Will Lazarus receive those bad things? And now you go to 26 and it says, and besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from here to us. What's significant about that? Okay, great chasm. If you look at that in its original text, Gulf, uh, wide space, um, very long, a, a far distance, okay? What the scholars here will say is that this is another reason why it's a parable, okay? Why? Because look at what it says there. The people that want to cross from here to there, who wants to, who would be there in Abraham's bosom and want to go here, right? It's giving an indication that what you are, where you are, is irreversible. It's permanent. You can't get here, there, back and forth. Nobody here is going to even be aware of them. Lazarus likely doesn't even know what the heck's going on. Lazarus isn't even being spoken to. Lazarus isn't making any remarks. And it's far beyond belief that anybody where he, Lazarus, was in Abraham's bosom would want to go down to be where the rich man is. All right? So that's why it's an indication that it's an example, an illustration of the fact that we, that is irreversible. You don't have that second chance. It's not, well, I'm going to live this way, and when I die, I'm going to be able to go, yeah, I got it. No. It's here or here, and this cannot be passed. That's the illustration. Try not to infer too much more out of, out of that because it's not specific. Okay? I'm trying to get through this, guys. Hang on. Uh, and that's indicated by the word fixed. All right? That's permanent. A wall fixed between you and us. A great chasm has been fixed. Permanency. Okay, he answered, Then I beg you, Father. Again, refers to him as Father. Send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. He's now still referring to Abraham as father. He's still not talking to Lazarus. He's still asking Abraham to send Lazarus. Go see these my brothers. He's thinking about his people. He's thinking about himself. He's still centered on his things. Doesn't that mean he realizes it now? He's not asking to go anywhere. Yeah, so why would he tell other people not to go there? Maybe he say send me back. What's that? Why wouldn't he say send me back? Because that's kind right. of what he's saying. Right. He's right. saying send Lazarus. Don't do me. He's saying send. He, he knows. The rich man knows. He's, this is it. He's done. That's why he's saying. Don't, he's not asking. Hey. He's not asking to get out of there. Either. No. He knows it. Send Lazarus to my representative. Exactly. Send Lazarus because I can't go anywhere. I can't get out of here. Well, then, fine, just send Lazarus, will you? Go, go talk to my five brothers. They don't want to come here. Right? Maybe he's showing a little bit of uh, remorse at this point about himself not listening. Right? It's still focused on him. Yeah. Right? His attitude hasn't changed. So his whole being is still who he was on top. And now he understands why he's here. He's not asking to get out. He's not saying, I'm sorry. He's not asking to repent. Because now, and how do you know he doesn't even think about repenting until let's get to the last few verses? Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Abraham saying, They got all they need. 
They've got everything where you're at. That was ending a sentence in a preposition. I shouldn't have done that. They have everything they need to not go to where the rich man resides. Thing they need. And what is Moses and the prophets? It's the scripture, right? It's what they knew by heart, right? Moses, the, the, the Old Testament's divided into three parts, right? What is it? Law. Okay, law is what? Written by Moses. The first five books, the Pentateuch, right? The next books are what? The prophets. And then what? The wisdom literature. Okay, law, prophets, wisdom. All right, so that is all of the scripture. Abraham's like, man, you got it. You've got everything you all need. You've got the Moses law and you've got the words of the prophets. You don't need anything else. You've got everything you need for salvation right in front of you. So then what does he do? He goes, nah, no, Father Abraham. He's disputing the theology of Abraham, essentially, right? He's like, no, 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 that's not going to cut it, Abraham. No, nah, it didn't work for me. He's like, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if they, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Now he's talking about, well, man, if I would have seen somebody die and then come back, I'd have been good, I'd have repented. I'd have, been, I'd have been fine. Not true. He denied this, he, and he's not questioning what Moses said. He's not questioning this, the Scriptures. He's not saying, I never heard about that. What do you mean? I never heard about Moses. I never heard about the prophets. He knows exactly what Abraham is referring to. But he's like, yeah, I know. I, I had all that. I got it. I, I had all that the whole time. But if somebody comes back from the dead, I'd have believed it. Then I would have repented. And he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Meaning that you do not change. If you don't take the faith that we have been given through this, even seeing somebody rising from the dead will not change you. Because they had it. The rich man had it. And what's hugely significant too is in the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, Jesus at, in chapter 9 starts moving towards Jerusalem to be crucified, right? That's when he starts going. That's when he commits to the, I'm getting on the road, I'm, I'm taking off, that's where I'm going, to be crucified in Jerusalem. This is chapter 16. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. <coughs> this is in the midst of his journey. And he's saying, you guys have somebody standing right in front of you. And you guys will still not believe me when I rise from the dead. That's right. And that's what he's saying. He's like, guys, the whole rich man, everything is the Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees, the, the chosen Jews. Right? And he's saying, you guys have everything you need. But when I come back, you're still not going to believe it. So everything that you have in your hearts right now is essentially worthless. Because you're out on the corners, you're praying, you're out on the corners, you're preaching, you're doing all of these things, blah, blah, blah. But when this comes to life and the rich man is actually asking for somebody to rise from the dead, which Jesus will do very soon, even they will not Listen 
and trust in the scriptures that they've been given. So don't count on the fact that when you die, you'll have a chance. Because you won't change. You will be what you will be. You will be what you are. So is this a story about the rich automatically go to hell, to Hades, to Gehenna, and the poor automatically go to heaven? No. It has nothing to do with that. Go back. Go back in the context. It has to do with the wealthy are obligated to take care and spend and use their wealth accordingly for the kingdom, for the people, the, the, those that are laid in front of their gate. We don't know why Lazarus is in paradise. We don't know why he's in heaven. It doesn't say anything about Lazarus. It's, it's an implication. So he, Lazarus obviously believed, right? It's not, he didn't just go to Abraham's bosom because he was a beggar and poor. And the rich man didn't go to hell just because he was rich. Go back and read the other parable, which starts in chapter 16, verse 1. There was a rich man. And on, and on, and on, and on, and it all follows suit. So when you see multiple passages of wealth, right, it's easier for... A uh, camel to pass through the eye of a needle, then a rich man to go to heaven. Why is that? Because he's rich? No, because he puts all of his emphasis on the rich, on his wealth, on his things. So it's easier for the rich to be distracted. It's easier for the rich to put all of their focus on what they have and gaining what they have, rather than when a poor man doesn't have anything, it's it's less of an opportunity for them to put their uh, passion into anything other than hope in Christ. But it's the rich that have everything they need and they don't need or want for anything that they put that emphasis on coming back to get more and more and more. And now that becomes an idol. And when that becomes an idol, you have just created what it says in here, an abomination to God. Make sense? So, does anybody look at this parable differently now than when we first read it in the beginning? I hope so. I find it a little perplexing that we have more expository uh, spiritual meat from the parable than we do from the Bethany event, which was another Lazarus. We don't hear much from Lazarus regarding his experience of death because he was resurrected right. from the dead. Right. And that kind of stops there. And I think. And one of the reasons why they expound on that is because it doesn't matter. Because it matters more what we're doing right now and what we're doing here than what happens afterwards because what happens afterwards isn't going to change you. What happens afterwards, you're done. You are what you are right now or you are what you are right now. It just crystallizes you who you are. So the, the after death part, which is Jesus, I'm sure, could have gotten very specific about what the realms are like and what heaven and hell is like and what this and this is like and all of those things. But it comes down to the fact that Jesus represented the rich man in life the exact same way that he was represented in death. It's just now everything flipped. Rich, poor, poor, rich. Hurt, <coughs> living great. Living great? Hurt. Agony, not agony. Agony, not agony. Back and forth and back and forth. And everything just flips. So what that essentially tells you is the rich man 
had the exact same thing buried in his grave as Lazarus had buried in his. Nothing. Zero. What's in your casket will be in mine. Nothing. So don't put the emphasis on that. Put the emphasis on Moses, the prophets, the wisdom literature, and the New Testament, because you have give, been given everything you need for salvation. And dying ain't going to change it. Have a good Sunday. Thank <laughs> you.